Okay, so as the music stops, I believe I enter the scene. Um, good evening, everybody. I am Fabrice Tossi, and I am there to welcome the live audience because uh, our lecture tonight is a very special one. It's a hybrid format. It's the second time only that we are trying this. So it's uh, it might come with a bit of difficulties. If that is the case, we have someone who will take care to adjust uh, any problem that might appear, which means the luminosity, the sound, contrast, things like this. So you are welcome to uh, mention them in the chat box. There is a chat box somewhere. So if there is a problem, please let us know and the technician will try to uh, remedy to that. The people who are in the room, then it's an entire level of responsibility. Everything should be fine because you've got access to the main people. That's, the, uh, that's basically the main thing, right? You should have two screens, one that will show the, um, the PowerPoint and the other screen that will show the speakers. If you don't have these two screens, then maybe you want to fiddle with the options until you are happy with the, um, with the content. Okay, so I will leave actually the chairing to the person who is on site, who is uh, Sana Khalid. She's a PhD student at the University of Wolverhampton and she will present uh, herself the speakers for tonight. The only important thing is that you are more than invited, you are warmly recommended to ask questions. Science is about confronting ideas, opinions, you know, understanding. So if you don't understand, don't be shy, ask questions. There is two box, one question and answer, a chat one, but I'm sure that wherever where you put your questions, Sana will find them at the end and she will uh, pass them to the speaker. So please ask questions, everything that pops up to your mind, you put it in the box. With this, I let you in the company of Sana. Please, Sana, if you want to take it from there. Um, good evening. I welcome you all to the first student-led ILP talk at the University of Wolverhampton. Our speakers include Ashish Sharma, James Hackney, and Ravi Singh, who couldn't join us tonight. And they're third-year physics students who will talk about their adaptation and replication of the experiment performed by Eratosthenes himself. Um, the most interesting outcome of which was getting a group of physics students to walk for 10 kilometers. I believe we're also joined by a special guest, that's Eratosthenes himself, who would like to firsthand talk about his experiment. Hello! Yes, I am Eratosthenes, and I am here today from the past to support these fabulous students in their experiments because this is an ex what's this i've come from the past i don't understand this technology there's people inside this box here i'm sure you're all watching this fabulous experiment that's going to unfold before you i was born i've got some notes <laughs> i was born in Cyrene, which is, which is libya and it actually it was a very long time ago it's about 276 bc and of course that isn't before covid that's before the current era, of course. And um, of course, that's a very long time ago. And of course, I'm dead already. And um, because I come from the past today, and I hope you can understand my language, because of course, I'm talking ancient Greek to you. So obviously, everybody out there can understand me. I know it's slightly tinged with a black country accent. But again, I hope you can all understand my somewhat uh, Greek lingo. Now, Unfortunately, I am already dead, 
I was a fabulous polymath. I did lots of things. In fact, I was the head librarian in the library of Alexandria. And you can see here on the slides, I don't even know what any of this is. It's fabulous technology. Here is a nice picture of me teaching one of my students. And uh, yes, I was actually the head librarian and it was working in the library that allowed me to do my most famous experiments. Now, I am really the father, my toga's falling off here. I am really the father of geography. And in fact, I believe that it was me who coined some of the terminology that we use today. And I called my map a geography. And uh, you can see a recreation of one of the maps that I am reputed to have created. And um, it was the first time this sort of thing happened. And indeed, the projection of the globe that we see today was part of my work. I was the, I'm gonna stop, my beard <laughs> are falling off, boys, they're falling off. Um, and um, they were, the projection of the globe is really down to me. I was the first person to draw the globe with meridians and so on. So the projection we see today is part of my work too. Okay, thank you. I don't know what the buttons do, so it's, it's good you're doing that. And um, we've got a bit, we've got a, no, that's fine. And um, so, of course, I was a polymath and a mathematician, and I was really interested as well, because I was, uh, uh, re you know, really interested, like a lot of people were, and a lot of people are now, in prime numbers. And, um, and as a friend of Archimedes and things like that, I was interested in all sorts of things. He's a best mate of mine, you know, Archimedes. And um, so I invented this thing called the sieve of Eratosthenes. And what it does, it works out prime numbers starting with multiples of two, okay? Now, it, the multiples of a given prime are generated starting from that prime and so on and so on and so on until we can get primes all the way up to about 112 or 120. So I developed this sieve of Eratosthenes and uh, it's still used today. Now, of course, what we're here to do today is to talk about my fabulous experiment. Now, I noticed one day, looking down a well, and this was actually, you know, around well, 240 BC, so it's a very long time ago, of course. It's been a long, a long journey to get from 240 BC to get to Wolverhampton today. But um, I was in a place called Syene, which is where modern Aswan is today, I, I've been told. And um, I noticed that the shadow at midday, down the well, I could see the sun right at the bottom. It was right above me and it didn't cast a shadow. And I started to think about the possibilities of what this could be all about. Now, so I decided, of course I worked in Alexandria and um, I discovered that on Midsummer's Day, the shadow from one of the towers in Alexandria would cast a shadow at a particular angle. Now I knew that the sun was at zero degrees, if you like, because it was right overhead in Aswan. Okay, I'm sorry, in Syene. So what I did was, because of me working at the library, I had loads of information actually to my hands. And so we had these people back in the day, they were called beanatists. And what they did was, was measure things. So I knew the distance between Syene and Alexandria. So I could work out the difference in the angles that these shadows made from zero to the angles that I saw in Alexandria. And actually that allowed me to measure the circumference of the earth because all it is is the distance of the two cities divided by the difference in the shadow angles. Simple, really. Now, of course, the distance over these two things between the two cities was great. And I know that other people have been trying to make this better throughout the years. And this is exactly what these fabulous students at the University of Wolverhampton have been doing for one of their projects. So let's hear about how they're trying to beat my calculation. All right, thank you very much, Eratosthenes. It's an honour to have such a renowned ancient polymath among our ranks today. So, uh, as described, we at the University of Wolverhampton have chosen to uh, recreate the experiments because we were drawn to the fact that such, with such simple tools as a stick in the ground, 
uh, we've, Eratosthenes and the scientists who come after him have been able to calculate something as grand as the size of the world that we live in from such simple tools. And with that in mind, we have decided to make our version of the Eratosthenes experiment as Eratosthenes-esque as possible. And this means several things. No automobiles. We, like the Bematists of old, we would have to physically walk from two different locations to measure the distance, uh, which means that we would have to pick something a lot more local than the distance since we can't travel 5,000 stadia in a single day with our physics students' legs. We're too unfit for that, I'm afraid. Uh, and the other thing is that everything we do would be mechanical. There would be no electronics at all, no GPS, no, um, no electronic, range finding tools or anything of the sort. Everything would be with tools that would be available to Eratosthenes or his contemporaries. Now, the first thing we did, of course, was a lot of research regarding the topic at hand. And one of the first things we made was a model of the Earth to um, better understand the dynamics of the shadows uh, with regards to the sun crossing the sky. And this model, model was made by Ravi Singh, who sadly could not join us today, but he has sent us a video of how he constructed this ball and what he used it for. So I will let him speak. Hello and welcome to the IOB lecture on the great polymath Eratosthenes. I'm Ravi and today I will present what work I have produced in the course concerning the polystyrene ball. Within the research module, we have focused on Eratosthenes of Cyrene and dedicated most of our time in reproducing his experiment in approximating both radius and circumference of the Earth. Two tasks have been employed to help drive us to our results. The first is a method of obtaining the radius and circumference from Wolverhampton and the Edo outreach without its 20th century liberties. The second being the creation of a model Earth from which we can attempt the experiment on a smaller scale as a supplement to the larger feat. I've concentrated my efforts on the second task, straying away from participation with the real-world application. Eratosthenes determined the circumference of the Earth using the Egyptian cities of Alexandria and Syene, Syene sorry, with the assistance of an obelisk and well, respectively. It is believed that at noon, the well of Syene casts no shadow, and using this time, in fact, he would soon obtain his results. The polymath used the angle adjacent to the obelisk and opposite the structure's shadow length, and multiplied it by the distance between both cities. The origin of this distance is unclear, but it is suggested that it was recovered by Bematists. Multiplying the distance angle ratio by 360 degrees would then provide Eratosthenes with the value for the circumference of the Earth. A value for the radius can then be acquired by dividing the circumference by 2 pi. I completed the experiment on a polystyrene ball of diameter 40 cm using cocktail sticks set in the sphere between a certain distance, one representing the structure in Alexandria and the other the well of Syene, and with an ordinary suspended light bulb in place of the sun. The ball was rotated to provide varying shadow lengths, with the minima concerning shadow lengths at noon. Using trigonometry to find the angle adjacent to the Alexandria cocktail stick, and opposite its shadow length, and multiplying it by 360 degrees, by the circumference of the polystyrene ball, in a crude but similar fashion to Eratosthenes. The radius of the ball is then found by dividing the circumference by 2 pi, and can be checked by for its accuracy using the manufacturer's product information. Here are the calculations required to obtain the circumference and radius of the polystyrene ball, shown in three parts. The first part presents the use of trigonometry and alternate angles to determine the angle between both sticks. The second part shows the distance angle relation, which is then scaled to accommodate the circumference. The last part contains the actual values of the radius and circumference. Here is my graph and table of results. The experiment conducted by Eratosthenes has been completed by several men across the span of time in history each calculating a value for the Earth's circumference. Another Greek figure, Posidonius of Rhodes, observed the star Canopus on the horizon at Rhodes and Alexandria, and used the arc measurement method to calculate the circumference. The unit of distance employed by both Eratosthenes and Posidonius was stadia, and wasn't fixed to a particular value. Greek and Egyptian stadia vary in length, leading to various results made by other Greek scholars. A similar issue concerns the Indian astronomer Aryabhata, who followed the method of Eratosthenes. He determined the circumference by noting the differences in time and distance between two points on the same latitudinal circle. By obtaining an angle of 1 degree and then multiplying by 360, you would find a value for the Earth's circumference. 
However, his choice of unit of measurement was indeed varying and not concrete, the Yojana. This was believed to be four times the distance a cow call can be heard. A unit of distance commonly employed by astronomers across Asia, the Yojana allowed for various estimations of the Earth's circumference to exist because its conventions were not fixed. The father of algebra, algebra Al-Khwarizmi, also obtained a value for the, of, for the circumference of the Earth. He set out with scholars to determine the length of a degree of latitude. They continued to walk down a road until they could note a one degree change in the elevation of the North Star, which they then used to calculate a value for the circumference. To conclude, I wish to highlight certain improvements that could be made to the experiment. Firstly, the orientation and setup could be changed. This experiment was indeed, indeed crude, obstructed, and limited in the amount of resources it consumed and required, and because of this, certain factors could not be accommodated. For instance, one proposed setup was to use a portable lamp instead of a typical house light bulb, which would instead provide a declination angle of zero. Continuing on this point, to have more closely imitated the experiment of Eratosthenes, I could have altered the heights of the cocktail sticks to resemble both structures, then creating a model where similarly one stick casts zero shadow, very much like the well in Syene. If this is more a visual tool, it is mentioned to present greater intrigue to the audience of an outreach program who may recognise each structure from the Eratosthenes story. Furthermore, a polystyrene ball could have been attached to a rotating mechanism and clamp to better keep it in place while being rotated. This issue is clearly evidenced in my graph, where certain values of the shadow length do not correspond to the curve of best fit due to the ball not being properly contained. Due to the nature of the setup, it can be taken onto campus where other Farnoya physicists can conduct a repeat of the method, hinting at the change in perspective similar to Eratosthenes' experiment where debate is present on whether it was slaves being used or provided information and given cartography that determined the distance between the Egyptian cities. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Robbie. So, uh, as Robbie mentioned, uh, many people before us have repeated this experiment. Uh, here is a selection of more uh, modern recreations. As you can see, uh, yes. As you can see, uh, these measurements here uh, have all been done over large distances, it, hundreds of kilometers. And uh, this particular group here had, um, had measurements in many different countries at the same time. But uh, ours is unique in that, ours, in that our experiment only takes a distance of 20 kilometers. And all the others have used modern conveniences such as GPS and automobiles and electronic rangefinders and the like. Whereas ours is entirely mechanical, as Eratosthenes himself did it so long ago. So uh, the first part of the of any experiment really is the research portion, and the first question that we asked ourselves is when is the best day to do it, because the sun is at a different height every single day. So which day in particular would give us the best chance of measuring? Uh, clearly the uh, circumference of the Earth. And we found that the day that had the best difference in shadow lengths between two locations, as this black line can show you, was December 21st, the winter solstice. And this makes sense because on the winter solstice, the smallest change in the angle of the sun gives a big difference as to the length of the shadow. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do it on the winter solstice precisely because of COVID, exams, poor weather, but we managed to get fairly close on the 4th of February, which is at here. Uh, you may notice that um, on the list it says Stockport and Wolverhampton because we, at the beginning, presumed that all the others, like all the other experiments before us, that we would have to go over a significant distance uh, like 66 kilometers between uh, Stockholm and Wolverhampton. But we found that with a distance of only 20 kilometers, we could get a difference of 0.1, which is 0.1 on a one meter object, which is a, which is a very good measurement. So ultimately it was decided that these two points would be the sites for our experiments, Fordhouses Park and Stevens Park. We chose these points because they're 
almost directly north and south of each other. They're about 20 kilometers apart and they're public places. So we wouldn't have to do the experiment in somebody's driveway and irritate everyone around us. So we divided ourselves into two groups. The first group was myself, Kelly, uh, Kasia and Dewey, who are all level five students who uh, volunteered to help us on this undertaking. And the second group was Ashish, along with his brother Arpan, Sana, the chairperson of this, uh, of this lecture, and Ruth, who is a physics teacher who also uh, does artistic projects artistic project, sorry, and has uh, and is currently working on an artistic project based on this very experiment. So a little bit onto our method. So on the day of the experiment, we had we used two different methods. The first method was the uh, nail on polar plot method. Could you pass me the torch? Thank you very much. Uh, so that's not really. There we are. Can they see that? Close. Uh, yes. Uh, as you can see, the uh, a nail was blue tacked onto a piece of polar plate piece of polar paper and as the sun moves across the sky every five minutes a small dot was placed at the very tip of the shadow and this method was quite useful in that one person could do it by themselves and uh, you just had to do the dots every five minutes and you didn't have to measure it and you could measure it uh, later on uh, but of course, the shadow is quite small, so you do have to be fairly accurate with that. Uh, uh, we set it up so that there was the absolute minimum possible disturbance. The paper was sellotaped to the clipboard and the clipboard was sellotaped to the ground. And the ground was uh, measured so that it was exactly level, so that there was no sort of disturbances that could modify the length of the shadow aside from the sun. The second method was with this kebab skewer that Ashish acquired. The, the angle of the shadow was measured using this red string here and this was recorded and originally we were going to use this string to measure the distance but that didn't turn out to be useful. It was much more convenient just to measure it using the standard tape measure. And as you can see on the screen, a bit of paper was placed at the edge of the shadow because it's quite different to, difficult to see a shadow on concrete because it's gray on gray. But with that paper there, it uh, made the tip of the shadow much clearer and much easier to record. And this was done every five minutes, weather permitting, of course, Sadly, due to the English weather, there were points where we couldn't take a visible shadow measurement, but we simply waited for the clouds to pass and took a measurement as close to that point as we can. We used a stopwatch to precisely measure the time to ensure that uh, there was no error there. And uh, unfortunately, we had to cut the experiment short a bit sooner than intended because the Shisha's group was caught in a uh, classic British Rain, rainstorm, which was unfortunate, but one, but we did get a selection of data, and once the data was completed, we began measuring the distance using one of these, a trundle wheel. As you see, it extends out like this, Sorry that. Uh, and as the wheel spins, can you see? As the wheel spins, uh, this little uh, counter here increases every one per meter. And all of this is mechanical. There's no electronics here, aside from the light, which we did use, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, yes, we followed this route. 
Play this round. No. Please stay stand by. Oh. Now it's going. Okay. So Ashish's group started at Fort Hudson Park and followed this blue line down to the University of Wolverhampton, where they took a short break. And uh, we decided to meet up at a central point after the experiment because we didn't, rather than um, starting at the central point and going outwards, because if we started the center, we, there it is right there for, uh, the, uh, in uh, Sedgley, uh, weather students. Uh, and rather than starting there and heading outwards, we decided to go outwards in because we didn't want to miss solar noon, which is the most important point on the graph. So we thought it would be more convenient to do our experiments at solar noon, ensure we get that, and then meet up in the centre after that. Here is where we started in uh, Stevens Park in Stourbridge. Uh, my group followed this blue line over the uh, Dudley Canal. Uh, to walk where we took a break and after taking a brief break there we made our way up the A road towards the weather spoons which is honestly another deciding factor because we could all meet up at the end have a drink have some food and compare data uh, moving up to the there we are so we met up at the at the weather spoons, compared notes, and we found something rather interesting. There it is. We found that the distance between uh, Ford's houses and Stevens Park was exactly 23 kilometers, down, exactly 23 kilometers down to the meter. And that may seem like we're fixing it a bit, but to be more precise, uh, my group found the distance to be uh, 12,523 meters, and Ashish's group found it to be 11,477 11, meters. I've turned my phone off, I don't know why it's going. <laughs> uh, but yes, we joined up to find, to compare our data, but um, yes, we, sorry, that's throwing me off a bit. Uh, we met up, compared data, and to give you the results of the, the, that data, I will pass you over to Ashish now. So, give a hand for him. Yeah, okay, thank you for that, James. Um, okay, so I want to talk about, wait, no, not formula one. I want to talk about one formula. <laughs> right, that's it, one formula. Anyway, um, so, so here's just a little diagram to show, if I just get the laser pointer up here. So here's just a little diagram to show what's going on. So, um, um, so uh, obviously uh, locally, the, um, on a, uh, the Earth does look uh, flat um, and um, it will look like this. So the, an object will cast a, a shadow of, um, a shadow length of S and the object is height H. And remember this angle here. So that's this, that's called the solar altitude angle. So, but that's not, um, that's not the only thing though. So um, we want a formula to predict how the, the shadow will move um, throughout the day. And um, intuitively, we know that the shadow is shortest at solar noon, and the shadows get longer towards the evening, and they're quite long in the morning. So we wanted a, an exact formula to predict the movements of that um, on an exact day, and how and to predict how that would vary uh, throughout the day. So to do that, we need to consider uh, different things. So the the first thing to consider is um, the way the um, Earth moves around the sun, and one of the things that affects this is the um, is the tilt of the Earth. So the Earth isn't straight like this; it's it's tilted. So, um, and I've shown it here. So it's tilted by twenty three point four five degrees. Um, and here's the axis of rotation shown here. Um, and 
And this angle here is um, between the equator and a ray from the, from the sun is known as the declination angle. So at this point, so in this diagram I've shown here, this is in the um, summer solstice when the, um, so let's say we're on that location. So that's facing towards the sun. So the, de the declination angle would be 23, uh, positive 23.45. Now, as the earth um, moves around um, to winter, um, that, um, that same point will be on the other side and the declination angle will then be negative. Uh, so minus 23.45 and, um, and at um, the spring and also equinox, the declination angle is zero. So, um, and actually the spring um, equinox is coming up this Sunday. And what that means is that at the equator, the sun will be directly overhead. So, okay, so that's one piece of the puzzle. So then, um, so then now you can intuitively see, so as I explained previously, the, um, so it's 23.45 in, in summer, minus 23.45 in winter, and you can kind of see that it, it will vary sinusoidally. So that explains the cosine here and the factor of minus 23.45 at the front. And um, 360 is just the degrees in the circle as the Earth rotates around the sun. And uh, 36, 365 is the number of days in a year. And um, D here is defined as the day of the year. So D equals one is 1st of January, D equals to 2nd of January and so on. And this plus 10 here is there because the winter solstice for, uh, falls 10 days before the 31st. Uh, so it's on the 21st of December and that's 10 days before the end of the year, which is 31st of December. So hopefully there you can intuitively understand this equation. So the other pieces of the puzzle as well are, so the latitude. So of course this shadow on the globe will be at a particular location. And um, so I've shown in purple the lines of latitude. So, um, you know, scientists, um, if they want to be really accurate, they'll uh, give the latitude and longitude of, of location. Um, they won't just say Wolverhampton, they'll give the precise latitude and longitude. And that's indicated here. So um, these purple lines kind of um, like on a globe or on, if you go on um, Google, you will see um, the latitude like this. And if we cut a cross section through the earth, um, that's what it would look like. So here's the equator here, and I've shown the declination angle. So it's, this tilt is, and this is five of, of this particular. So I'll put a stick there, and that's the five, and that's the declination angle. And, um, and there's that important angle alpha there, which is the solar altitude angle. And now um, you might notice as well that um, there's the, um, you can see the alternate angle theorem here. Um, so I, uh, you can also recognize it as a Z here. So you have two parallel lines here, the line that cuts across and that's the Z. And this angle here, so this one right here, that's phi minus delta, which means by the alternate angle theorem that this angle at the top here will be phi minus, phi minus delta. So that means that alpha will be 90 minus phi minus delta. So, um, okay, so now we're putting the pieces together. So now um, um, the final piece is, to, is this um, variable I called omega. So this is uh, factors in the, the, um, the speed of rotation of the earth every day. So the earth goes through 360 degrees in 24 hours. So if we want um, degrees per hour, that would be 360 divided by 24, which is 15 over here. And the H minus 12 just centers it around solar noon. And H is the time in hours. So, um, and now doing some research and some trigonometry, you can see um, we get this formula uh, with, with alpha and, um, and here you can see all the variables coming up again. So uh, the latitude phi, delta and omega. And the final piece um, is that 
the shadow length, which I okay, incorrectly called R there, it's um, F, so it's S is equal to H over tan alpha, uh, or tan of alpha is H over S. So that's all the formulas. And then for and then inside this uh, tan of alpha, you would substitute this, this uh, long expression into there. So um, right. So then now we've got the formula. So then to do the preliminary work. Um, now um, we we have the formula now, and we wanted to predict uh, how far we should go. So let's say um, in that formula we sub uh, we substitute a phi of um, uh, in Wolverhampton um, in um, so I've selected railway drive Wolverhampton, and the definite so the day of the year is thirty five, which corresponds to about to fourth of February, and um, and now factoring, so, and what I have plotted here is what I've called the shadow length percentage error. So what that is, um, is the, so you have the shadows in the two places and it's the difference in the shadow length divided by the average length, average length of the shadow. So, um, and then we wanted that to be about 1%. Um, which would, uh, which uh, we thought was reasonable and would make um, measurements um, easier. And we found that we had to walk either going uh, south or north, that we had to walk uh, about 20 kilometers, which is where that number comes from. So, okay, so I've explained uh, where all the formulas come from and everything. So now um, afterwards, we put all the data, um, we put all the data together and plotted some graphs. So over here, you can see, so I've plotted James's skewer data from the 4th of February. And um, here we have the shadow distance uh, in meters against the time in hours. So the blue, uh, so the blue points are James's points. And this line, this curve is the theoretical curve. So you can see that, um, firstly, uh, we didn't capture that characteristic, um, you know, the, uh, the fact that it goes down, the, the distances go down, and then uh, there's a stationary point and then it goes up again. We, we didn't manage to capture that. And that was because we started measurements at 12 o'clock. We did it from 12 to one, which is around the stationary point. So the shadow length won't vary that much. So um, the measurements would have to be more accurate to capture some difference. Um, and, and I'll talk about this later as well. Um, it would be better to um, actually do it earlier and maybe at nine or 10 o'clock and go on to, to later on in the day. Um, yeah, and the other reason as well is just um, poor weather. So it was um, hard to collect a lot of points. And as well, you know, you, we're, when there's like clouds every five minutes or something, you know, we're working against the clock as well. So it's not like, we're nice and relaxed on a nice sunny day. Um, so yeah, and then that was consistent with all the data. So with the, um, so with James's nail data and of course my skewer data and nail data. So unfortunately, um, because of the, um, because this was consistently um, lower than the curve and we collected a uh, few points. Uh, we couldn't conclude anything from, from this data, but uh, still after the after 4th of February, um, we still had the opportunity to um, repeat the experiments um, in our backyard. So uh, James did that and I did that as well. Um, and we, so we just went outside whenever, whenever it was sunny and we tried to um, measure the, the shadows again and to see if we could get anything better. Um, so actually recently as well, um, so I, there was a nice uh, sunny day and like the skies were clear the whole day and, um, it, and yeah, I managed to make this nice, um, make this nice, uh, 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 collect all these points. So I, but there was a gap in the middle, however, because I did have to go to, uh, for a lecture um, and have some lunch, of course. But yeah, 
Um, th these are all the points I collect, could collect by myself on that day. So what I've got plotted here is the um, angle. So I, I use the nail on the polar paper that James talks about, and I've plotted the um, angle against the time and hours, and um, and then using uh, what's called linear regression analysis, I found the line that best, best fits these points here. So um, here's the equation of that line. And the important thing is um, this, uh, the gradient here, which is a 16, and that's um, degrees per hour. And if you remember, that comes up in the uh, formula I showed before. Uh, and it should be 15, but we found it to be 16. And not just this graph, but uh, other data as well, um, uh, which I've not shown here, but we, we did uh, many uh, iterations of this, and both James and I found that it was consistently faster. We found the speed of rotation to be consistently faster than what it should be. Um, so that's a mystery, and maybe you can help solve that mystery. Um, right, so then here is that, uh, so here are the same points, but then, uh, so I've plotted the shadow length in meters against the time in hours. Um, so you can see I went uh, from 10 o'clock all the way to about um, half past four. So and now the other part of this was to, to try and find a curve, to try, to try and find a, a curve that best fits these data points. So you can see it's a, it's a non-linear curve and we did um, linear regression with a non-linear function and um, so I've got um, here the way we um, put the, um, the the way we uh, made the formula. So, so you can express it in this way with this summation, where um, the beta beta k corresponds to beta one and the, and beta two, and the cos omega. Well, uh, this is x here, but uh, it doesn't matter. So this is the um, hour here, and that's that would go in here. So, um, and then um, you can write it as a, um, express it as a matrix, and then finally express it as a vector. So um, phi one and is, is just a column of ones, and phi two is the cosine of, um, of omega. And um, this y here is, um, is the, uh, is a vector which has the shadow lengths. Um, so, of course, uh, so we um, found the variables beta one and beta two um, to fit the um, to find a curve that would best fit the data points, and it looked like this. So this is um, actually really good, and you can see that it fits really well with all the points. Um, so. Yeah, so beta one, of course, is corresponds to um, the sine delta sine phi, and beta two corresponds to cos delta cos phi, and um, and actually you might recognize this as a, a compound angle formula. So you can uh, so if you put beta one plus beta two, that would be the cosine of phi minus delta. Um, so so for the um, for the best fit. Uh, curve, we found, um, so we extracted the phi minus delta, and um, I'll just mention briefly, there were, um, there were different points um, on, the, so there were different uh, phi minus delta, but we could rule them out because um, either they were symmetric, um, it corresponded to the opposite side of the globe. Um, so, um, yeah, so we could exclude some of them as we found um, the, the this value phi minus delta. So the best fit was 55.23, and the theoretical is 55.77. So this is a um, 0 0.5 change, 0 0.5 degrees of latitude, which corresponds to about 55 kilometers. Um, so if you uh, just plug these in on Google Maps and you can see that for yourself. 
Um, so, um, yeah, so it's, um, so, in a, so it's a complete, um, just put to this point. So, so, um, so as you can see in that last plot, um, there was uh, more data points there. So to put, to, to put everything together, um, it means to, to do this experiment better and to possibly uh, achieve a, so this was 0.5 degrees um, accuracy. So we could possibly get 0.05 degrees uh, by maybe choosing, doing it on the winter solstice and um, using a longer stick and taking a um, wider, much wider range of points um, on the day. And I've put here what remains next. So uh, pass the baton onto, um, onto the, potentially the level fives who might be doing this experiment next year. So um, maybe you'll, you will recreate this experiment and yeah, the, the things I've mentioned to do it better. Uh, so with solstice, a longer stick and um, a wider range of points, um, I think you can do that. And also with the um, Institute, Institute of Physics, um, we could perhaps involve some schools as well. We didn't get the chance to do it this time. Uh, we still involve other people, but um, hopefully next year's lot can involve other schools and try and get them motivated and interested in physics. Um, yeah, that's the end of my talk in my section. Wow, talk. Um, all right, so, so thank, thank you all for, for watching our video. Uh, our video, our, our lecture. Yeah. Well, it is. I'd like to thank the speakers for their very interesting and insightful talk on their experiment and I'd like to open the floor to any questions if anyone has any. So that's online and in person as well. So I'll have a chat. Yeah. Okay. Any questions in the chat? I'll keep an eye on the questions in the chat. I think Alton's got one. Um so just to start us all up, I'd like to ask a question myself. So if you could go back to the slide on other people's experiments compared to your own? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's just disabled the laser pointer. <laughs> yes, so if you could just um, explain what it means with the Earth's radius and where, why your work falls on that part. Uh, this was a this was actually taken early on that uh, the actual radius we weren't actually able to find a conclusive uh, radius that should say circumference should it is it radius, radius, radius. It's radius. Yeah. we weren't able to find a conclusive one for uh, for the reasons that she described earlier but when if we took the single points at around solar noon it gives a radius of like down here, which is substantially less than what it should be, which is why we disregarded it because, um, because as Ashish mentioned earlier, it simply wasn't taken over a large enough time span. So the noon, there wasn't enough variation in order to get a definitive line of best fit. And so, which where would the Earth's radius lie on that? Oh yeah, so the Earth, the Earth's radius is um, six thousand three hundred and seventy-one kilometers. So that would, um, and it's shown by this line here. So that would lie about there. Yeah. And so through your work, you managed to obtain something slightly larger than the Earth's radius. Smaller, substantially smaller. But that's just from a single point, and that it's it's not good practice to. Um, determine that's so based on your yeah. single points. We would have to have, we would be, ideally we would be comparing the lines of best fit from measurements throughout the entire day. Mm -hmm. And are there any more questions? It was, so why did you choose the length of sticks that you did choose, the nail and the skewer? Um, 
was they, they chose it for convenience or for overall accuracy or uh, portability? It's or? because they were convenient. Uh, the nails came in a variety of sizes. So we just picked one because the, one of the main differences between these two experiments is that obviously this one is a lot more accurate because since the shadow is longer, any mistakes, like small mistakes, like millimeter length mistakes mm -hmm. in the measurement of the shadow wouldn't matter as much. Whereas this one, a millimeter is a very, a very significant margin of error. But the benefits of this one is that can it, be, it can be done by one person. Whereas this one takes about two or three people. And the, if, if the level fives were, or any other future scientists were to use a longer stick, that would also be more cumbersome and require more people to, to take the measurement. So this is kind of the quick and dirty method, mm -hmm. but it did get some good results out of it. There's also a question online. Um, could you explain briefly how taking into account time and shadow trajectory allows us to give an absolute measurement of the latitude in addition to the solar angle? I can repeat that question. Yeah, you're, you're, again. Could you explain briefly how taking into account time in the shadow trajectory allows us to give an absolute measurement of the latitude in addition to the solar angle? The latitude. Hmm. I think it's saying that how do you measure the latitude? You mentioned this, I think, in one of your slides. You're talking. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Here's the thing. Yeah. In the measurement itself, we didn't need the latitude. All we needed was a difference in the observed solar angles to determine to get an estimate for the circumference of the Earth. Um, the latitude only came into it using the for the theoretical line because the theoretical line requires the latitude and the declination angle. Neither of these things are required in the on the day experiments. And ideally we wouldn't need them at all, but it's just what we use to check our work. Yeah, it's what we use to check our work against. Okay, so, so that curve we had the really nice best fit line. Yeah, yeah. Um, that one there that works really well. That's, um... That's based on the latitude and declination angle. Okay. Whereas the points aren't. Do you or do you work out the latitude from that, or is it? So yeah. So we um, so for this, um, you can see the we don't plug in the delta and phi beforehand. Uh, we uh, work it out. So um, so you can see we have beta one, beta two, which corresponds to this, and then solving um, this equation. So uh, once we find um, the values of beta one and beta two. You can solve it using online software and then uh, find the values for delta and phi. Thank you. I've got a question. Can I talk to these? I'll ask a question. Mm -hmm. I, of course. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask, I'd like to, I'd like to ask your, your calculation for, for the spin of the Earth, right, in degrees, I think was quicker than you expected. Yes. Do you think the world has actually sped up? <laughs> Could you be right? Well, since we've come out of lockdown, it seems like the world is better. That, that sense. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> no, it's probably. Uh, to be honest, we haven't the faintest clue. Yeah. We yeah. haven't the faintest yeah. clue why we observe a one degree faster spin than everyone else has observed. We we thought originally thought that it might be something to do with the difference between a solar day and a side real day. But that difference is only four, mi four minutes, which doesn't correspond to a one degree error. It's only like, like a tenth of a degree error, if that's the case. Like if ours was a tenth of a degree faster, that would be like, oh yeah, fair enough. But uh, an entire degree, that's very mysterious to us. So we're open to suggestions on that. Thank you, students. <laughs> There's another question online. Why does the longer stick require two to three people to operate it? <laughs> <laughs> Shall, shall, shall we demonstrate? <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> okay, so you've got one person holding the paper in place. Yeah, so imagine, okay, yeah. imagine this is a paper. So this will cast a shadow. 
Yeah, okay, this will cast a shadow somewhere here. And this is on the so ground, mind you, so you need, can't get any lower than this. Yeah, so you need someone, yeah, and then to take it all the way here. Yeah. So, and then find where the shadow lands here. And then you've also got the, the red string for, to find the angle as well. Yeah. And you've got another yeah. person with the phone uh, taking the time measurement and another yeah, yeah. person with the bit of paper to record the measurements. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. And that's not counting all of the, there's some potential error with uh, moving this around slightly as you're taking the measurement. That's what the uh, chalk was for, to place a marker on the ground yeah. so that if it did get out of line, we could put it back again. I think that was a good demonstration. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it demonstrated just how chaotic this was on the day. This was not an easy thing to do. Yeah. There's also a request to see the um, differences between the fourth of February experiment and the line of estimate that you obtained, where um, there was significant improvement. To see the differences. Um, I, yeah, okay. Um, hang on. They want to see the differences, so. Like the improvements in your situation after the 4th of February experiment. Um, yeah, so this is the plot the, um, I did later on. Um, and, and I think um, just to expand on that request, yes. um, what were the changes that you um, went through to? Oh, to, what were the changes to make this better? Yeah. Right, okay, so, yeah, so this was really like a um, trial and error process. Um, and to, and it was just really the day as well. Like the day was, it was really nice and sunny, like not a cloud in sight. And um, compared to the 4th of February, which was intermittently cloudy yeah, yeah. and occasional. And, and as well, I had, um, over time, I got better at um, actually making the, um, plotting the point on the photo paper. Um, it's surprisingly sensitive um, to changes. So you have to be quite careful, have a steady hand and everything to make the points. And just the fact that, um, yeah, I just did it over a much longer time period as well. Um, so yeah, um, so, so because of that, the, there's no, um, because this is at around, I don't have the laser pointer. So around um, noon, there's a, um, it's a stationary point, but because I collected points before and after, like you can see here, just a small change in time produces a bigger change in the shadow distance as opposed to around here. And it's the same like beforehand in the morning as well. So yeah. If there are any more questions, you can send them to yes. me. Yeah. Uh, I think there might be. And we have one in person as well. Yeah, if, 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 if it's fine. Yeah. So in, if the audience can hear me. All right. So I had a couple of technical questions, like for for example, from where I'm sitting. Uh, it seems that this uh, spirit stick is not is not ideally vertical. So it was on the day. It's been bent since. All right. All right. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, been in my, it's been in my rock pack, rucksack for about yeah. a month. <laughs> All right. Great. So then, uh, then it's it's a relief. Yeah. But actually, <laughs> the most uh, the most important question I think that uh, I I can come up with: uh, Can your experiment be treated as uh, the once and for all proof uh, that uh, the Earth the surface is indeed spherical. Uh, I wonder if there is any possible peculiar interpretation within the flat Earth paradigm to your data. Right. So even though we didn't find um, the radius of the Earth um, uh, from the fourth February experiment, still. So this was um, so. So these points here. Um, there's not like it's it's not like someone else was a distance away and did the experiment, so we couldn't can't get the radius from this. But uh, what did what this did show is the curvature of the Earth um, with the phi minus delta, uh, which corresponds to the latitude declination angle. So, do you we, have any comments for flat Earth? <laughs> <laughs> we we hope that uh, with the improvements that we uh, we recommended that any group of people can replicate this experiment for themselves and with only a 20 kilometer difference, one can replicate this experiment themselves. Like you don't have to travel a thousand odd kilometers north or south to 
do this experiment that anyone would be able to do this essentially in their own backyard. That's what we hoped to demonstrate. Even if we couldn't do it ourselves this time, we, we I hope that we have shown that it, it can be done. 